Okay, let's start. I'm very pleased to have uh, Hayat and George here to talk about self-supervised representation learning for astronomical images. Uh, I believe this work is very, very exciting. Um, Hayat is a fourth year PhD student of electrical engineering at the University of Arkansas. His research is on predicting hydration status using signal processing and statistical learning techniques from biomedical signals. In the past years, he has worked at Berkeley Lab and Nokia Bell Labs as a summer intern. Before joining the PhD program, he has worked as a telecommunication system engineer at Telenor Bangladesh. And we also have George uh, Stein, uh, the duo speakers today. Uh, George is a postdoc at um, uh, Berkeley Lab, and he's also a postdoc at the, um, sorry, he's also a postdoc at the Berkeley Center for Co Cosmological uh, Physics. George, um, George's research is centered on machine learning for cosmology with areas of interest and focus, including cosmological simulations, generative models, anomaly detection, and of course, self-supervised learning. Without further ado, I'll let you start your talk, please. Go ahead. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Mustafa, for the introduction. Am I audible? I guess I am. Yes. OK. Cool. So hi, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about uh, our work on self-supervised representation learning for astronomical images. So as Mustafa said, this is the work we did together with George, Peter, Zaria, and Mustafa uh, last summer. And we have already uploaded the, the manuscript of the work. Uh, you can uh, go through the slides. I have pasted, just pasted the link in the chat. I can click the blue links. Uh, while throughout the slide that are actually the links and the first link on archive is uh, going to point you point you towards our manuscript so uh, before uh, going through the uh, our work I, will, I want to talk a little bit about the sky surveys and the motivation behind the work um, we know that we are generating constantly generating lots of images throughout the internet um, using different social networks and so on but there is um, a very good source of uh, uh, cosmological images from different sky surveys. Like the images you see from here are from Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And there are going to be other digital sky surveys uh, from the Vera Rubin Observatory Euclid project and so on. And they are going to create a huge number of uh, galaxy images, almost like 10 billion. So you can guess from the number of the images that it is, that is very likely there are many images that are never that are not going to be seen by any human eye. And, uh, but we need to analyze those uh, large number of images because we, that, that are going to help us to understand the evolution and nature of our universe. We can, uh, we can try to find out rare objects and anomalies. And um, like the kind of work we have tried to do is to do some classification tasks like to find out the galaxy types that if, did, if some galaxies are spiral or disk or, or something like that, or probably any kind of regression tasks like uh, uh, predicting the redshift from the images. So you have the image and you want to try to predict the redshift of the galaxy. So one common way that people have done it uh, th this kind of thing for a long time is, we all know is the supervised learning. In this case, we have the data that can be image or can be something else. And um, if we follow um, usually machine learning techniques, the classical machine learning, learning techniques, we might use a support vector machine and other kind of things. But in this case, if we think of the neural networks, then we actually fix the the architecture of the network, in this case, probably CNN or feedforward neural network, then we split the data set on training, testing, and validation. And most importantly, we have the labels for, of the data. And um, what is the common source of these labels? Usually people um, uh, are used to annotate these uh, labels. So for example, but, the, but having these labels is very time consuming. Um, the ImageNet data set that is very much used in machine learning community. At the very first stage, uh, it, it collected almost like, I remember 3 million images, annotated 3 million images, and it took like two and a half years to do that. And obviously 
it did take a lot of time, money, and obviously, in in, in a specialized kind of data set, it also uh, involves uh, specialized knowledge on annotating the labels. So that is actually the the most critical part of supervised learning. And once we have this training and validation data set, we train the model uh, you, uh, uh, in, in using backpropagation in, in, in neural networks. And then we have this model, then we feed in new data set that doesn't have any label and we can predict or, cloud or do the classification or regression, assuming that the unlabeled data and the labeled data, they're coming from the same distribution. But um, as I said, that getting labels is difficult, time consuming, and also, uh, also uh, takes into account of the domain knowledge. Other kind of paradigm involves the unsupervised learning um, that involves PCA, uh, distance-based learnings, and so on. And then and super, unsupervised learning does not take into account of any labels, but it is somehow gets very difficult to, infuse domain knowledge in, in unsupervised learning paradigms that makes uh, it really difficult to beat performance of supervised learning paradigms. Um, so the other kind of um, research people have been doing is that we know that in supervised learning, if we have larger number of data and correspondingly larger number of labels, we improve on performance. But at certain limit, it cannot improve the performance that we end up in a reducible error zone. That even though I have a large number of label data, the performance is not improving. Then in that sense, the, the other possible improvement scope is that, what about if I have less number of labeled images, but I still can get um, two or three times uh, better performance than, than having uh, uh, that what we have been doing so far. And based on that, there have been pretty much uh, decent work going on for a long time. Active learning is one of them that how to select the best subset of uh, samples that if I can label them and get reasonable uh, good results. And also semi-supervised and weekly supervised algorithms are also there. But the recent, um, uh, kind of paradigms in, 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 in this line of work is the self-supervised representation learning. And what happens in the self-supervised representation learning is that in the first step, we try to learn the lower, uh, low, uh, lower dimensional representation in a task agnostic way to without any labels. And then using this task agnostic way, uh, task, task agnostic representations, we, we, we do some downstream task that can be a regression or classification given that we have uh, labels. And there is a very good survey on uh, self-supervised learning that can be of two different types, generative and contrastive. contrastive. Our work is basically, basically mostly focused on contrastive learning. And um, possibly a, a, a lot of you might know that the autoencoders and variational autoencoders uh, can be categorized into a generative uh, self-supervised learning. And in this case, and why it is different from self-contrastive uh, contrastive learning paradigms is that in autoencoders, I have this image or any, any input, and I try to come up with a, a reconstructed input based on a, a lower dimensional representation. So you can guess that the input and output, we want to, retain that input and output to be the, almost the same, uh, that can be easily done by using an identity function. And this is what we exactly what, try to avoid. So to avoid the coming up uh, with the identity function, we do uh, a bottlenecking. So we introduce an encoder that takes it in the image and maps it into a lower dimensional representation and the decoder expands it. And um, in this case, we actually do not do any kind of augmentation, any kind of tweaks uh, in the image. And um, we are actually just comparing the same image and its constructed version. So it does not take actually account of the small variation that are possible in the real life data sets. The only good thing is that we can say that we have a lower dimensional representation. 
that can actually help us doing the low uh, downstream tasks. And this kind of uh, autoencoders are mostly used uh, with um, mean squared loss error and uh, and uh, that kind of errors, but does not compare the same image with other images. And this is where the contrastive learning comes in. So um, self-supervised representation learning we are talking about in this uh, manuscript or paper in our work is actually based on this contrastive learning approach. And um, in late 2019 and early last year, 2020, there have been some work on um, on the contrastive learning paradigm uh, in Facebook and Google. And they started competing with each other. And uh, we found out that that kind of algorithms can be very useful in our work. And this is what we have tried to do in, with the astronomical images. And this is the very core idea of the algorithm uh, that we have plenty of images, all of them are un un unlabeled. So for example, if we have this image in the blue border. We take the image, we, 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 we do some augmentation on the image to come up with two versions of the same image. For example, in this case, the XQ is actually the rotated version of the image X and XK is also rotated, but we, if you can see that it, is, it has more noises. And uh, then both these images go through encoders uh, this encoder, we call it just a simple encoder, and this encoder should be appropriately called a momentum en encoder. And this, both these encoders have the same network architecture, but the parameters are going to be different. And going through these encoders, uh, this, the, this, the two augmented version of the same image gives us two different representations, ZQ and ZK+. We call them positive samples. And also from previous exam, uh, previous images, we stored the representations in the momentum encoder branch. And you and we call this the stored the stored representations are stored in a queue. And in the momentum momentum and in, in the contrastive learning approach, what we are trying to do is that we want to maximize the similarity between ZQ and ZQ ZK plus and try to minimize the similarity between the other samples in the queue. And in this process, we actually try to learn the representations uh, given the augmentations that are actually inherent or semantically useful. Uh, the Q length can be, the, the Q length we have used is actually 5% of the whole data set. So it actually is a, is, is, is a good representation of all the variation in representations we have throughout the, the input image set. And uh, the encoder part actually, the moment of encoder part actually changes slowly so that we can, uh, we can, we, we can trace out the changes. That means that we do not come up with representations that are distinctly different from the ones stored in the queue. And um, and the, the, the similarity uh, I was talking about, the similarity and the similarity approach is actually ca uh, captured in the contrastive loss that is here in the right bottom. Um, we are using, in, in this case, we are using the cosine similarity to, to measure the similarity between the representations. And regarding the, uh, the augmentations we have used, uh, so, some augmentations can be useful in some efficient task. And in our case, we found out that these are possibly the, the good set of uh, augmentations. One is rotation. And uh, so we rotate the image. So the input of the, the input image you collect from the SDSS data set is 107 pixels. And we rotate that randomly between zero to 360 degree. And then we move the center of the image uh, uniformly. That can be from minus seven to plus seven, uh, left to right and top to bottom, just to move the center of the image. And then we introduce Gaussian noise based on the channels. And also to take into account of the foreground uh, 
dust noise from the galaxies. We also augment the images with galactic extinction based on the established model of the ASTSS data set. So all these, all the, all these simulations on all these things we have in this paper or work is based on the SDSS data set. And also to take into account of the variability of the point spread function, we also used a uh, kind of blurring that goes into, um, that models the point spread function. So uh, finally, the, the image we have after all these augmentations is actually 64 times 64. And this is actually seen by the encoder. And finally, when we are done with all these representations, and when we can say that, yeah, we are getting some representation that is actually, you know, trying, uh, is very much good at distinguishing our, our the ZQ with ZQ minus and, and finds out very much similarities with ZK plus, then we stopped the pre-training approach. So the whole approach I have been talking till now is actually the pre-training and then we almost discard the momentum encoder. We just remain with the encoder. So now if I feed in an image in the encoder, I get the representation. And now based on these representations, I can do the downstream tasks. And how these downstream tasks can be useful? That, um, so for example, in this case, and uh, uh, the representations are of length 2048. So for each image, I get a vector of length 2048. And uh, based on all these images, I get representations. And with these representations, we can do similarity search that has been really promising in our results that we can take, uh, we can uh, take a representation of an image and just do a dot similarity product search with all the other representations of other images. And if we sort that in a decreasing order, uh, we, we try we, we start seeing some similar images and that is actually very helpful in uh, finding anomalies that is um, uh, that, that is in the following slides and also we can uh, distinguish uh, uh, just using a linear classifier we can get some really good performance on galaxy morphology or class, class, galaxy classification and also uh, redshift prediction uh, so for the redshift prediction that has been the main focus of the work I have been doing in the summer, uh, we have beaten the state of the art model with the fully supervised and also with the uh, self-supervised model we have developed. So these are the all possible exciting opportunities uh, of uh, work that we can do, obviously, uh, with this uh, uh, huge data set with fewer labels, but still getting reasonable and good performance. And um, this is the data set we used. SDSS is a five band uh, data set. Um, and also we, the, the, the total data set we have been working with is actually 1.3 million images, both including labeled and unlabeled. And um, among 1.3 million, uh, 500,000 of them are labeled images. I mean, we know the true ground truth redshift of these images. And also from a crowdsourced platform uh, that is called uh, Galaxy Zoo 2, we have morphology classification from uh, not that expert people, but uh, that is based on a statistical model. And that is, uh, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is actually trying to crowdsource the labeling process. And as I said before, the, uh, the, the encoder we have been using is Resonance 50 with a slight modification and um, uh, what total images that has been trained is actually 1.3 million. And we are using MoCo2 that is actually the algorithm behind uh, the social robust learning. Um, and uh, is also there is another algorithm that is called Simclear that is from Google. MoCo2 is actually from Facebook. And they actually started appearing at the very beginning of last year. They, they started to beat each other and they you know, improved on, on, on each other. And the, our motivation of work is actually coming from these two. And, um, and, and, uh, and prefer, we started working with MoCo2 because Simplier is um, computationally more expensive and requires um, TPUs. We don't have that. Um, 
And uh, yep, so we add labels and then do the downstream task. So the following slide, I'm going to stop my presentation now, but I'll be in the background. So now, um, George is going to take over and is going to explain the results. And yeah, please feel free to ask any question in between. So I'm handing it over to George now. All right, thanks so much, Hayat. Uh, I'll just share my screen here and then I'll continue on. Um, can you all see that? Uh, Yes. And my cursor? Yes. All right, perfect. Well, uh, thanks so much, Hyatt, for giving a really good introduction on, on, the, on the topic and how the self-supervised contrastive framework uh, is working for this, for this uh, application. Uh, I'm going to focus on the downstream tasks that Hyatt uh, briefly mentioned when he was showing the, the illustration of, of the network. Um, and there's a number of different downstream tasks that we're targeting here. Uh, so if you have specific questions about uh, any one of them as I go, feel free to please just jump in and, and, and ask your questions and we can have a little discussion on each one because they are, they are separate uh, downstream tasks um, from each other. Um, so uh, as Hyatt said, we, we toss all 1.3 million SDSS images. Um, we do the self-supervised uh, pre-training uh, with no labels. And what we do is we boil down the 1.3 million images into these 2048 dimensional uh, representations, where these representations should be invariant to the augmentations that we threw in, the rotations, the jitter, the Gaussian noise, and all of this. Um, so before highlighting a specific downstream tasks we use, uh, the first thing we did was, was to visualize what information is contained uh, within these representations. And to do that, uh, we first just reduced from 2048 dimensions, because that's very hard to visualize in a, you know, on a 2D slide, uh, to two dimensions using uh, UMAP, uh, which is a nonlinear um, dimensionality reduction technique. Uh, some of you may be more familiar with you know, T-SNE, uh, but we just use UMAP because it's a computational performance on such a large data set. Uh, but I want to highlight here, too, that these representations, so these are just the 2D uh, you know, UMAP representations of the 2048 dimensional vectors, where each data point here is a, is a five band image. Um, but um, for our downstream tasks, we're just using a linear layer. So for both our classifications and regressions, we're just plopping a linear layer on to these 2048 dimensional representations. Um, so, so therefore, uh, it is not, you know, what we're going to see in these visualizations, it's not due to some complicated nonlinearity of UMAP itself. We're only using UMAP so we can visualize things and then UMAP's very quick and easy to use. So we're going to look at a few things that are going to take this overall shape in the two UMAP directions. Um, but uh, first, we're going to look at that instead of just, you know, a bunch of, of unlabeled black data points. Uh, we're going to sample an image uh, from each point in this two-dimensional space. Uh, you, you plot the image, and you get something that looks like this. So this here is just the two-dimensional UMAP space with representative images drawn at, at each point in the space. Uh, and this is learned in a completely unsupervised fashion, yet we see that there is a clear, you know, a clear separation between galaxies of different morphological types, uh, different colors, um, and, and, and all the different things that are happening in this 1.3 million images. So in the top left here, you know, we see a bunch of brighter, um, large, large galaxies. Along the left-hand side, we're seeing more, uh, you know, more um, edge-on galaxies. Uh, and, and interestingly, uh, in this visualization, was all these things over in here which at least to, to me, I was not an expert on this SDSS data set. I was not expecting to see a lot of these, you know, these green images here, these red images here, uh, some clusters of, of like green lines through the images, which are all various uh, just imaging artifacts from the, from the telescope and from the data reduction pipelines um, that at least to me, uh, we're not, I, I was not expecting to see all of these in the data set. 
But you know, the representations in, a, in an unsurprised way, contrastive learning has learned to separate all of these different types of galaxies uh, from one another. And if we zoom into this, uh, you know, these are every little thing is an individual galaxy. Uh, this is probably easier to see. And like I'm saying, right, you can scroll through this thing for hours. You know, I, I found this very interesting to look at exactly what information has been separated. And, you know, there's merging galaxies here and galaxies next to each other, and it's getting dimmer as we go down, and all the way down to, you know, here we're seeing possibly some, some stars or, or maybe some other things that were not expected in this uh, galaxies, uh, galaxy image data set. Um, and then we can, we can start to bring in the labels. Uh, so here on the left is just that same image, just, just that same illustration, just all the images from the UMAP. And here on the right is where we're bringing in some labels from various different sources. Uh, so we have, as, as Hyatt mentioned, uh, we have crowdsourced labels based on the morphology of, of the galaxy. So these are things like, uh, you know, um, citizen scientists were asked, uh, is this a disputed edge on, which, you know, is, is like a, a line, like one of these things here, or is it face on, yes or no, um, is it a smooth galaxy, or does it have features or a disk? Um, and we see that these representations, right? We just color the, the points by the, by the uh, answers to these uh, classification tests. And we see that, you know, it has, it is, uh, the self-supervised learning has separated face-on galaxies, these dark blue ones, from edge-on galaxies, these, you know, pink lines, to the, to the order where I can almost just draw a, you know, a classification boundary by eye, say anything to the right of this is face-on, anything to the left is edge-on. And you're going to get a, a quite a high accuracy just from these very similar sim, or simple, you know, by eye classifications. What we what we actually use is linear classifications. And then you know, I show that we show this for a number of of uh, questions, right? Like features and disks are all these these brighter, larger ones here. Um, we also show uh, the regression labels that we have. These are the the redshift where low redshift galaxies are, are here and high redshift galaxies are, are over in the middle of this space. Um, and we see that these representations, at least by eye in this UMAP visualization and various other visualizations we did, they seem to have very nicely separated galaxies based on uh, the semantic information in the image, which was the whole point of doing the self-supervised learning. So that was some visualizations. And here's some more concrete uh, downstream tests that we did. As I mentioned, we, we did three main ones. And the first one here is uh, what we're calling you know, similarity search. Uh, and you can use this for various types of data discovery. Um, so you know, uh, broadly stated, given an image, can we find other similar images in the data set? Um, and this is similar to how like Google uh, image search works, where you, you paste in an image. Um, and it goes and finds other images that are that are similar to this image. And it's not doing this based on an image level, right? It's not taking an image and doing some dot product with every other image and then sorting by the largest. What it's doing and, and what we're doing here is you take your desired image, um, maybe picked from that UMAP visualization, which is what I did, pick some interesting things, some of those um, imaging anomalies, some large galaxies, some small galaxies, and what you do is you, you pass your image through your encoder, you get your representation, and you just do you know, a dot product with of your query representation with all 1.3 million other representations. You sort uh, by decreasing order, and you just return images. And this here is, is an image taken from our NEREPS workshop paper, uh, where, where this is what we did. On the left here, I'm showing the query images. So these five here and these five here. And the following five images are the most similar images from the data set according to a similarity search on the representation space. And we see that uh, you know this we, we we get returned a number of interesting images. If you're looking for, you know, just simple edge on dim galaxies, well, here's five other ones that semantically look almost identical, at least to, to me. Um, you know, brighter edge on galaxies, maybe, you know, merging galaxies or, or at least galaxies that are projected near each other. 
ones that are quite close to each other, a lot farther than this, spiral galaxies, you know, elliptical galaxies. Um, and interestingly, like, like Hyatt was saying too, this is, you can use this sort of as an, uh, an anomaly search. Uh, maybe it's not an automated anomaly search, but say you find one weird image that you weren't expecting or one weird instance in your data set, such as this one here. Well, the, when we saw this, we were, like, we were you know, a bit surprised to see it. So what we did was, was did a similarity search and out popped many other images, you know, not thousands, but, but a decent number of similar looking images, which we think are, you know, these are imaging artifacts. Maybe these are airplanes going over the telescope, satellite trails, uh, cosmic rays, something of that order, uh, where you've, you've, you've isolated, given one example, you've isolated maybe not all the other examples, but a significant number of similar examples. And then maybe what you want to do is, is, is throw out these images or you want to flag them for further investigation uh, or, or a huge number of, of anything you'd want to do with the similarity search. Many, many applications. So that's one that requires absolutely no labels, right? You just train this self-supervised, you do a similarity search and you get similar images. Um, the second downstream task that, I'm, uh, that we're showcasing here is a classification tasks, a number of classification tasks, where the goal here is, is directly from that 2048 dimensional representation is to predict galaxy Z2 uh, morphological labels directly from the representations. Uh, so what Galaxy Zoo 2 is, as Hyatt mentioned, is it's a, it's a crowdsourced platform where you can go online um, to the, the Galaxy Zoo website, if you click on that, and you're showing an image of a galaxy. And what you do is you, you label this image through this complex decision tree. And you're first asked, is this galaxy simply smooth and rounded? with no signs of a disk. And, and you can say, I think it's smooth. I think it has features are a disk, or I think it's an artifact. And then, you know, based on your answer to the first question, you, you're directed down a different uh, uh, branch of this tree. You know, well, could this be a disk viewed edge on? Yes, no. Is there a bar? How many spiral arms? All, all these detailed questions on the, the, on the morphology of a galaxy. Um, and this is a crowdsource platform where hundreds of thousands of people you know, volunteered their time to help label galaxies. And in the end, uh, at least for Galaxy Zoo 2, there's, there's about uh, a couple hundred thousand uh, galaxies that have all of these questions labeled for them. Um, so what we're gonna do, instead of you know, what you do in a supervised, training, or a supervised framework is you design some CNN you take your images, you try to predict for each question, you, you'd split it into, you know, design a, a network to predict each question. But here we're just going to do a number of these classification tasks directly from the representations. So, so what this actually looks like in practice is just a linear layer from the 2048 dimensions to one, where that one dimension is just the probability of it being negative or positive in a binary classification task. Um, and it's, you know, this is super quick, right? It's just a 2048 dimension for each thing in the data set. It's a linear layer. And, and this thing's going to train in about half a second to 10 seconds on a GPU, depending on your number of samples or uh, training samples. And what we found was, was that we got very accurate uh, classifications, uh, which, which from just the simple UMAP visualizations, I think was, was apparent that these were going to be accurate at predicting uh, you know, the morphological types of galaxies. But here we're showing three different uh, separate classification tasks, three questions from the galaxy decision tree. So the first one here is, is does it have features or a disk? Here is, could this be a disk viewed edge on? And here is, is there a sign of a bar feature through the center? And these top three panels show with a very limited number of labeled samples. Right, so this is 250 labeled samples here. Um, this is the prediction, and this is the true label. And we're seeing that you know we're starting to converge upon a, quite an accurate answer. 
at least for what we call high quality samples. So these, these labels, you know, it's crowdsourced. Sometimes the images are very blurry or hard to determine. So it's not, you know, really a, a, a binary task. There's a, there's a lot of uh, mis mislabeling. There's, there's a lot of various errors going on in these. But even with, you know, a very limited number of samples, 250, we're able to get uh, quite an accurate prediction. And using the full training set, you know, we get we get a highly highly accurate classification task or classification uh, prediction, at, uh, at least for these these tasks that we've looked into, uh, as compared to a supervised learning framework, where you know if you have mislabeling, label uncertainty, and only 250 training samples, you're not going to be able to train a a ResNet 50 with 23 million parameters uh, on that. Um, so this is you know a classification, a set of classification downstream tasks. And a third thing we we looked at, uh, which was the focus of the summer work, uh, we looked at this in a lot of detail, was the photometric redshift prediction. So this is, given an image, what is the redshift of this galaxy? Which, you know, is a, is a, what is the distance of this galaxy? Um, and like Hyatt said, we have 500,000 labels. Which, which seems like a lot, you know, half a million labels. Um, and previous works have shown that using a supervised framework, you can get a, a pretty good answer for predicting the redshift from an image using this. Um, and here, uh, so what we're going to do is, is we're gonna take our representations, same as before, we're gonna plop down a linear layer and we're gonna train that linear layer just as we did in the classification tasks. But here, there's one additional change where in the classification, uh, we just directly use the representations uh, and we never, you know, we, the, we never use the labels with the images at the same time. But here, as we're training this linear layer, we're also updating the encoder with a very small learning rate. So the encoder itself is, is, is you know, it has the loss back propagated through it and the weights are being updated. And we, we show here three different, you know, quality metrics of your redshift prediction versus the true redshift, which you have from spectroscopic follow-up. So in this left panel is the bias, in this center panel is the dispersion, and in this right panel, this is the number of outliers, the number of catastrophic outliers. Um, and we show a, you can look at this in, in two different ways. So here, first, uh, this this Pasquet et al. This is the you know previous state of the art on on this specific SDSS data set and these five hundred thousand labels. This is a fully supervised convolutional neural network setup, um, and we show here on the x-axis uh, the the quality metrics as a function of the amount of labeled data used. So this is you know previous state of the art. And this blue here is our ResNet 50 in a fully supervised um, setting. And we see here that using the full training set, full set of labels, you know, we're getting very similar answers on the, uh, on the quality metrics as the previous work, which is a you know, very good sanity check. And then here in the red, uh, this is the, the key one to look at. This is the results of First, instead of just doing a supervised learning, you first do uh, your self-supervised contrastive learning. You learn your representations, and then you fine tune these representations uh, by adding on this linear layer and having a small learning rate on your encoder. And what we see is using the full data set, 500,000 samples, which 500,000 labels, which, which seems like a lot of labels, but even using the full labeled set, we're able to improve uh, upon what we what was achievable in a supervised setting. You know, so these are the number of outliers has decreased by like thirty percent. Uh, the dispersion has 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 decreased, and we're just all around getting more accurate redshift predictions from uh, this labeled data set. But perhaps more interestingly is to look at the plot in a different way and just take a constant you know, y value here and look at the plot along this axis. And what we're seeing here 
is, you know, with 2% of the labeled data, we're achieving what was possible with, with 5% in a supervised setting. Or with 10%, we're achieving what was, what was possible with 30% of the labeled data. So if you look at it this way, if you're in a, a setting where labels are hard to come by, uh, which, which a lot of things are, uh, you know, they are difficult to come by when you're getting millions of, of crowdsourced images done or when you're doing a spectroscopic follow-up, which is, you know, this survey is, is taking years or decades in order to get this data. Uh, by simply doing the self-supervised learning first, you can increase you know, the size of your data set, or you, you can get the equivalent results to as if you increased your data set labels by factor of, you know, two to four, uh, at least for this, this specific task here. So I'll finish, uh, you know, with just a quick summary here. Um, so we showed a number of uh, downstream tasks. Uh, we first did this unsupervised or self-supervised learning with no labels. Um, and then we showed that it can uh, achieve notable performance gains over supervised learning uh, for various different tasks. All of these downstream tasks were just with the same trained network. So you're, you're not having to train a full ResNet 50 from scratch for every classification task, every regression task, you know, every similarity search task. It's just one network that you then apply to everything you'd want to do for the sky survey. Um, when you have a very limited number of training samples, it excels over supervised learning. But it also you know, seems to do even better when you have a large number of training samples. And, uh, and this is just you know, the, the start of, where, uh, of how self-supervised learning can be used for sky surveys. Right? Uh, we're really interested in automated anomaly detection, um, in robustness quantification. So as Hyatt said, in the supervised setting, you train your network, and then you hope that your unsupervised data comes from the same distribution. Uh, well, the self-supervised learning, it's been shown in a, a number of works that this can perhaps improve the robustness on your predictions, or you can use this as some sort of metric, use a similarity metric to determine how, how well should you trust your network on unlabeled samples. Um, and it has a, you know, a number of interesting applica applications where you can train a, a really large model on all of your data from a sky survey. These new sky surveys are, are hundreds of millions or billions of images. And then you just serve this model to the community. Um, and then whatever downstream tasks that, that people are interested in looking at, they can start from this model as a baseline. Because obviously there's, there's far more things to do with sky surveys than, than the group of us is, is possibly, is ever going to be able to achieve um, just, just doing them all on, on, our, on our own here. And the last slide here, I'll, uh, I'll just, you know, uh, show how, uh, a sketch of how this works in other fields, which is pretty much exactly as we talked about here. For whatever experiment or any data set you have, you just take all your data with or without labels. This doesn't have to be images. It can be 1D, it can be spectra or, or whatever you like. It can be 3D. And you just construct data augmentations that reflect changes in the data you want your network to be agnostic to. So various types of noise, various jitter, maybe there's some smoothing of your data or scaling, making things bigger or smaller. This is you know domain specific and, and whatever um, uh, downstream task you're, you're shooting for in whatever data set, you pick and choose what you think would be useful. You learn your representations and you use your rep representations. And hopefully, you know, you can improve what's, what's capable uh, in a supervised framework. So uh, those are the, the slides I have um, here. And this is the, an overview of the work. Uh, please check it out uh, online if you're interested in learning more. Um, and please send any questions to any of the authors. We're all very interested in hearing what people think we can do with this and, and, and various different uh, things that, that people are interested in with this. So I'll finish there and please uh, ask any of us any questions you, you want. Thank you, Hayat and George. 
I'll, yeah, so open the floor for questions. Yeah. Yes, David. Oh, uh, yeah, a uh, nice work. Um, in the in the UMAP uh, projection, um, are, is rotation um, completely um, washed out there, and so you're just seeing uh, like the the reference rotation, um, or or is 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 uh, our angle still meaningful in that space? Uh, so because of the um, augmentation, one of the augmentations we chose was to randomly orient by or randomly rotate by zero to 360 degrees. Uh, the orientation has been washed out. Um, um, but that's not, maybe this one's easier to see, but that's only a result of the augmentation that we chose. If you were targeting downstream tasks where you cared about the orientation, uh, you would not put that augmentation in. And then the representation should learn the orientation. So you can separate things based on the orientation. Uh, but here it, it's, it's not so much. You know, in this little panel, they're they're all kind of different ways because that was the augmentation. We wanted it to be in, invariant to that. Thanks. Hi. I have a sort of related question to that, actually, which was about you said you could make this embedding available for other people doing other tasks, for example. Um, but then linked with that, like what, what you just said, what um, you know, what a term augmentations you use is is kind of important to its usefulness for the tasks. So is there is there a way of dealing with that with like um, sort of pre training and re building from the same embedding? Or is it like you have to just make different ones? Um, so for this, we, we just chose the most base set of augmentations that would be mostly test agnostic. Uh, so if you were, you know, uh, we tried to keep it simple so that any any downstream task can be done on this. Um, whereas in if you were targeting something specific, maybe if you didn't care about the color, you would add in some augmentation that changed the color and, and you know, uh, therefore you wouldn't be learning the color information. Um, but I mean, maybe Hyatt, do you have any? Uh, on if, say, you wanted to add another augmentation, do mm -hmm. you need to retrain from scratch or do you need to, uh, is there some way you can do that in like a fine tuning? Yeah, I, I guess uh, based on, I mean, the motivation behind sharing this pre-trained model is that to come up with a general set of augmentation that we have been talking about. But I guess if, if you are more focused on something really specific, then uh, it would be more, it would be, better if we can scratch from the uh, train from scratch based on the augmentations and the tasks uh, you're thinking about. But that, okay. that's the way I would say to pin, pinpoint the task, you know, to come up with representation that actually serves the purpose. Okay. Yeah, I have another question, but I see Oshin has his hand up. So. Hi, um, just a quick question there about the um, extensibility of this. So this is set up with, SD, has been run on SDSS, um, but obviously there's new, uh, bigger and bolder and scarier catalogs coming down the line like LSST and Gaia. How viable will this, uh, will this technique be or how quick would it be to transfer to these new formats, do you know? Um, so it should be um, rather quick to, to transfer. So we've been thinking of uh, the dark energy uh, legacy uh, survey uh, imaging set. And there you have about, uh, you know, well, depending on what magnitude cut or, or what tar ob objects you're targeting, you have, let's say like 300 million images. Um, um, and, you know, the resolution's a bit higher. Uh, but the general framework should remain uh, nearly identical, almost where you can just swap out the training set and train on that. You're going to need a lot more, you know, training time. Uh, but maybe Hayat, do you want to talk a bit about how long this took to train and how, and the, the challenges of going to 300 million versus, versus 1 million? <laughs> uh, regarding the one we trained uh, with 1.3 million, it took, um... So if we train for 50 epochs, 
the whole set, it took like eight hours. But initially we were training even for more longer duration, but it seemed that um, uh, probably 50 parks or just eight hour training is enough. And also one important thing aspect of this, uh, this probably we don't need to train on the whole unlabeled data set because it's so big if it's representing the distribution of images in a fairly fair way, then probably you don't, we don't have to train the 300 million images, probably just uh, 3 million would be enough, provided that we are sampling from uniformly and getting the same kind of distribution. But there is always a trade-off of missing that out. But uh, yeah, and also regarding the question of scaling this, uh, relating that to other surveys, probably uh, there are some other factors may, in, in that case we have to take into account like the resolution and the, 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 the scope of per pixel and how much it is representing in the real domain. Uh, that is certainly going to be different from this uh, survey. But uh, like George said, but I guess the same frame, the framework would remain the same, but probably you might have to change uh, things a, a little bit to take into account of that. That's a good question, actually. Thank you. If, if you're looking for um, even more data, um, it seems like this type of methodology would apply to uh, microscopies like a light sheet or cryo-electron microscopy where you have um, large numbers of um, often blurry um, uh, objects or repeated objects. Yeah, it has, uh, it, I guess it, it, it can work equally good in that discipline also, but also, obviously, that uh, the, we need some kind of domain knowledge of the image set. Like, uh, it is very important to come up with a useful set of augmentation so that we retain the property of the images and we do not do any augmentation that actually distorts the inherent, uh, inherent properties that we are trying to figure out. So the, the framework would remain the same, but probably you have to come up with some innovative way of uh, domain specific or knowledge specific augmentations. Is this microscopic images are based on biological microscopic images? Are you referring to? Um, well, um, in all, all different sorts, but yeah, the, um, the bi you know biological um, things that can't be crystallized that are kind of big and floppy, but um, can be captured in um, uh, under a micro you know in fro frozen in water to often in a microscope slide. Um, you have many, many repetitions of the same macromolecular component um, in different orientations. Yeah, that would be interesting. I would, I would love to have a look at the, uh, I mean, we all would have to love to look at the data set if there is any. And we believe that it's going to work. We can give it a try. <laughs> Any more questions? If not, let's thank uh, Hayat and George again. Thank you so much for the great talk and exciting work. And uh, thanks everyone for joining. We'll see you in the next data seminar. Thank you everyone. All right, thanks so yeah. much everyone. Thanks a lot.